Hey guys, this is Craig Migliaccio with AC Service Tech, and today what we're going over is how does water enter an air conditioning system or refrigeration unit? So before I get into several reasons why and how, I want to go over why water is bad for a system, and the reason for it is is that water mixes with the oil that circulates through the system and it creates alcohol and acids. And so what happens is these acids end up eating away at the compressor. So how that occurs is the refrigerant cycles through this entire system and it carries the oil with it. And it does that so that the refrigerant can cool the compressor that's located behind this coil. It cools the compressor and then the oil lubricates the compressor. So the issue is if you have this mixture and the oil is acidic, what will happen is this refrigerant oil mixture passes over the electrical windings inside the compressor and it ends up eating away at the windings. So the the windings are protected by a resin insulation and the acid breaks that down and then you end up having a compressor burnout, the winding short. So you want to avoid that. So the issue is anytime that you are, say, disconnecting your hoses from a system and you see foaming and, and popping and bubbles and things, that's acidic oil. So you want to take care of that, add some neutralizer to that. Uh, the the other thing is you could do an acid test on this system. So you really want to avoid acid in a system because it will really do damage to that unit. So I'm going to be going over several reasons how this water enters into a system. One way that water gets introduced into a system is, is after attaching the gauge set. If you don't purge the air out of the lines and you accidentally put this air that's in these hoses into the system by, say, charging refrigerant into the system or say you're doing the disconnect procedure uh, and what that is is when you have liquid refrigerant in this hose and you've disconnected from here after you're shutting this valve off you're taking that refrigerant and you're charging it back into the low side but if you don't purge the air out of the lines before you do that you're going to be introducing not only moisture humidity and things into the system you're going to also be adding air into the system so i'm just going to quickly show you how to purge the air out of the lines and if you're looking for the disconnect procedure, I have that link down in the description section below. I have another video on that. So I'm just gonna show you this real quickly. You just shut this valve right here. You're going to open that up and you're gonna purge the air out. And you're gonna shut it. You're gonna close this handle and then you're gonna open the high side handle. And this handle you're probably gonna be able to hear and see. Right there. So you don't want to be releasing refrigerant into the air. You want to just get the air out of the lines. Otherwise, you're going to be contaminating this entire system refrigerant charge. So now we have the air purged out of the lines due to the system's pressure. We're going to go ahead and shut these gauges. So that's one thing you want to do before doing the disconnect procedure or adding refrigerant. Another thing to be aware of is in your hoses, Usually down here, right in the middle, you're gonna have a little oil accumulating there from these systems. And especially when you have your manifolds attached with both hoses at the, at the top right here like this, you're gonna have some oil down there. So you wanna make sure that you're blowing these out with dried nitrogen every once in a while to get that out, blow that into a container. And that's gonna help you to, to dry the hoses out. And then you're gonna immediately shut these hoses off so that, so that no moisture gets back into the system again. So remember that any time that you disconnect from a system, you want to go ahead and attach your, your hose back to the, to the manifold again to shut off the end. You never want to leave these open to the atmosphere because what's going to happen is you're going to have humidity coming in and it's going to mix with the, the oil. You're going to have a little bit of oil in these hoses, so you want to avoid that. So you're going to shut this end off right here, and you can do that with your, your manual low loss valve or your automatic low loss valve, such as this right here. You want to have these on the end of your hoses. So, you know, you, you have some hoses that have these built onto the end already, so you can use that. So you can just shut these off or attach them to the manifold to avoid that problem. Now, a way to avoid the disconnect procedure completely is by using quick connect test gauges or test probes. So you can use, say, field piece test probes, testo test probes, or another manufacturer's probes. But basically what's happening is you're only attaching this small portion. So it's positive pressure coming into here and then you just disconnect when you're done. So you don't have to worry about doing a disconnect procedure where you're having to put the liquid back into the system again, and that's really nice. So anytime that you're working on a system that you believe to have the correct charge, or even if it's low on refrigerant, and you, you put these on and you see, hey, it's low on refrigerant, you don't have to disconnect this one because you're adding refrigerant in over on the low side. So you just disconnect this one, add your refrigerant in, 
and then once again you avoid the disconnect procedure because you don't have to add any of the liquid from this hose back into the system again you just go ahead and disconnect from your high side so this is a, a good good method in order to avoid doing the disconnect procedure another big way that moisture gets into the system and i know a lot of people don't think about it but when you're attaching your manifold gauge sets to a running system that vapor line's sweating right so if you take that pore cap off you're having the humidity condense onto that suction line and the surface valve and it's sweating so what will happen is in that pore inside the pore and outside the pore you're going to have all this condensed water right there and then you're attaching your your hose onto that that's getting into your hoses and can get into your system and that's a that's a big deal right there i mean that's like that's like droplets of water that's that's a big deal so i'm going to take you in for a close-up image of a running system so you can see what it looks like while it's running here you see the port with condensed humidity on the inside and outside so it's crucial to take that cap off and immediately put on the hose otherwise you're going to have that water it's going to get into the hose and potentially right into the system so this is an example of this system only running for four minutes so you have that much humidity has gathered and condensed onto this port in that amount of time so a question that I'm asked is, can we avoid attaching the manifold gauge sets to avoid any potential for moisture entering the system and just by checking the charge with a temp sensor? And you can actually do that. It's just very, it's very time consuming. So if you're trying to check the superheat, you have to take the evaporator coil off, find the middle of the evaporator coil, tape your bead temp sensor on the, on the coil tube in the middle of the saturated state, and then you're going to tape your other temp sensor on the suction line right after it exits the the uh, evaporator coil on the suction line. Then you're going to put your cover back on, turn your system on, wait 10 to 15 minutes to check a charge, uh, and, and in this case you're checking the superheat for a system that would have a fixed orifice. And that's one thing you could do. You could also check the, the charge by finding the middle of the saturated state on this coil and taping your temp sensor there and then taping your other temp sensor on the liquid line down here. It's just it's very time consuming to try to, to try to get these located in the right spot and to avoid having an inaccuracy due to the air moving across the coil, you want to insulate these. It's, it's one thing that you can do, it's just time consuming. Another question is, can we just check the delta T and instead of checking the refrigerant charge? So a lot of people are uh, trying to rush through the preventative maintenances and they're just checking the delta T. And if you just checked it recently and, and you know that the refrigerant charge is good and you just want to go back and check the delta T, that's one thing. But if you haven't been to this system ever before and you're just checking the delta T, it's kind of rough. So the delta T is when you're checking the temperature in the return duct a couple feet before the evaporator coil and you're checking the temperature in the supply duct a couple feet after the evaporator coil at the indoor unit. So what I typically do is I'll put a screw into the plenum and I'll take that screw out and slip my bead temp sensor in in order to take my measurements. So that's how I'll do it. And so if you have a 70 degree return and a 50 degree supply, that would leave you with a 20 degree delta T. But here's the issue. Say you have an 18 degree delta T and, and you, you don't know if a system with a fixed orifice has any superheat whatsoever. So superheat, uh, if you don't have any superheat, that means that you can have liquid refrigerant he heading into a vapor compressor and that's going to damage the vapor compressor. So you, you have to make sure that you have superheat entering into the compressor, that's a, that's a big thing. The opposite side of this is, what if I have lower than 18 to 21 degree delta T? Does that mean I'm low on refrigerant charge? No, not necessarily. If you have a system that has a fixed orifice and it's high humidity or high heat load inside the building, you can have, say, a 14 degree delta T or a 16 degree delta T and the refrigerant charge is actually okay. The reason for this is, is instead of you having a high delta T, 18 degrees or so, your delta T is getting lost due to the amount of moisture that's getting condensed on the evaporator coil and you're losing it down your, your condensate tube. So it's a high heat load due to humidity and therefore you have a lower delta T. It's it's an issue that happens anytime you have high humidity. Water can also enter a system if you perform a bad vacuum procedure. So you're preparing a system for refrigerant and you have to run a vacuum down to below 500 microns in order to get all that moisture out of the system. You're boiling it and you're pulling it out of the empty system before you break the vacuum with refrigerant from either the bottle or from the outdoor unit. So, you know, if you're looking for the full vacuum procedure, the standing vacuum test, and breaking the vacuum with, 
with refrigerant from the bottle. We have a video on that linked down in the description section below. It actually compares a one hose vacuum setup to a two hose vacuum setup. Another thing is before the vacuum procedure, before the nitrogen pressure test, anytime the system is empty, you wanna replace that filter dryer. So the filter dryer is there to trap any water that's circulating in the system. So it has a limited capacity though, so you wanna cut that out and replace it before doing your nitrogen pressure test and doing your vacuum procedure. So right here you see that we have our, our vacuum set up and we have our vacuum gauge attached to valve core removal tools that are very close to the service valves of this outdoor unit. So you wanna have that vacuum gauge as close as possible to the outdoor unit and the reason for that is is you don't want to have it too close to the vacuum pump because you're going to read a a lower vacuum level than what you really have in the system so that's number one use a vacuum gauge number two get it as close to the system as possible number three is to perform a standing vacuum test and that's with the vacuum pump off so you want to valve basically valve off or isolate the hoses in the vacuum pump from the micron gauge in the system. So the micron gauge is now reading the vacuum in the system during the standing vacuum test while the vacuum pump is off. And during this time, you wanna see if the vacuum level rises. So if it continues to rise, then you have a leak. If it rises a little bit and stops, and then rises a little bit and stops, then that might be moisture in the system still. But basically, if, if that micron level just stays the same and it doesn't rise, then you know that you don't have any air you don't have any water, you don't have any nitrogen, and you don't have any leaks in that, in that system whatsoever. So it's a way to prove that you've done the best job that you can before adding refrigerant into that system. One more thing I find that a lot of people are doing is after you do the vacuum, you do the standing vacuum test, I'm seeing people actually replace the valve core. So they're putting the valve cores in before having a positive charge in the system. So don't do that. Make sure that you put the valve cores in after breaking the vacuum with refrigerant. So you can do that because you have the valve core removal tools attached to the ports. So, so then you know for sure that you still have a vacuum before you break it with refrigerant from the system. If you don't do that, when you go to put those valve cores in, you're losing your vacuum and you're introducing humidity into that system. So, so don't do that. I want to take this opportunity to let you know that we have our refrigerant charging and service procedures for air conditioning paperback and ebook both available at our website at aecservicetech.com. This paperback is available over at Amazon.com. But the, the nitty gritty of this is that you're getting into all the little step-by-step -step procedures. So the, the nitrogen pressure test, the vacuum procedure, breaking the vacuum with refrigerant from the bottle, breaking the vacuum with refrigerant from the system, checking the refrigerant charge on different types of units, and then also troubleshooting while measuring the refrigerant charge. We also go into some airflow problems. So we have this available over at our website and Amazon and the full outlines available over at our website so you can check out what it's all about. Hope you enjoyed yourself and we'll see you next time at EC Service Tech Channel.